Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Gillian Keegan, the government's Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills, a former apprentice herself. She left school at 16 to work in a car factory and pursued a business career for many years before becoming an MP in 2017. A Labour MP for 16 years, Culture Secretary, then Health Secretary under Gordon Brown, currently Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Dame Donna Kinnair, General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing. A nurse who went on to specialise in child protection and ethical law before taking up leadership roles in major hospital trusts in London and advising the government and other bodies. Joining us down the line all the way from Athens, economist, author, politician and former finance minister of Greece, Yanis Varoufakis and politician turned broadcaster, former Conservative MP and Defence Secretary, now living, we have to hope, is a more civilised life, travelling the world with a camera crew in tow, looking at trains, Michael Portillo. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to my guests here in the studio and, of course, to Yanis Varoufakis joining us down the line from Athens. Very good to have you with us. Our live audience is with us again via video link as we're doing it these days. Tonight you're all in Coventry or around Coventry so very good to have you with us. Thank you for being part of the programme and for all of you watching at home do join the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Let's hear what you have to say as well. So let's take our first question tonight and that is from Jack Davis. Uh, with cases continuing to rapidly rise and areas now going back into full lockdowns and venues uh, closing their doors yet again, is a second national lockdown not a case of if anymore, but when? And what does this mean for businesses already struggling to survive? So let's talk about lockdown or certainly greater restrictions. Andy. Well, we have been in lockdown uh, for most of the summer and have to say people in Greater Manchester are really, really struggling. And it, we're just finding it hard now with the way the government is, is handling this. I've tried to work with the government all the way through this crisis, but it does feel increasingly to people like we're being treated with contempt in the north of England because last night a newspaper uh, puts out a front page that says pubs and restaurants are going to be shut on Monday across the north of England. Now, I didn't know about that. They hadn't told me, but it doesn't really matter about me. What about the people who work in those pubs and those restaurants right across the north of England? And, you know, for me, this has just uh, got to stop, to be honest. We cannot kind of face a national crisis with the government just imposing decisions from the centre with no uh, agreement with, with people who have to face the real world today, where people are saying, we can't go in another lockdown, our businesses will finish. And this is the point that I've made to ministers. On Monday, I said to them, let's have a reset moment around this new traffic light system, this tier system. And I said, I'm prepared to go with it, but it must come with support. We've been under restrictions without support in the north of England, in Greater Manchester. Bolton saw pubs and restaurants shut, and the staff in those places who worked behind the bar in the kitchen had no local furlough scheme to, to help them. And the message I've given to the government is, is a pretty clear one. You know, there can be no restrictions without support. And if it's going to be the, the tier three restrictions, effectively a national lockdown, we have to go back to a full furlough scheme for those staff, support for those businesses. Otherwise, the north of England is going to be levelled down this winter. And I won't accept it. I will not accept restrictions without support. I will not accept the government just imposing these decisions on us, briefing them to newspapers late at night. They need to treat the people of the north of England with more respect. And when you say you won't accept it, what are you talking about? Civil disobedience? I won't support it. So earlier in the summer, they asked for my support and I did provide it. But if, if they come with restrictions, Fiona, without full support for the people and the businesses affected, I won't support it. <clears throat> but actually more than that, I will challenge it. I will use whatever means I can to challenge it, to get support for people, because otherwise they are going to suffer real hardship this winter. We are going to see businesses failing. I even threatened possible legal action over the A-level results in the summer because I wasn't prepared to accept that either, because that disadvantages, disadvantages young people in the north of England. We need a change here. I've offered to work with them time and time again. <laughs> but I think that the mood in the north of England this week, speaking to local leaders, business leaders, is the government has lost the dressing room and they need to work very hard now to get it back. Gillian? 
Well, I think what um, Andy hasn't said, actually, which is we are facing an unbelievably serious situation. And if you just put that into context, just a, less than two months ago, we were quarantining holidaymakers coming back from various countries around the world because they had more than 20 cases per 100,000 in those places. Today in Manchester, I believe it's way over 500 cases per 100,000. It is extremely serious. It's a very, very difficult balance that we have to make, but it's extremely serious. Two thirds of the hospitalization that has happened, all COVID patients in the whole of the UK has happened in the Northeast, the Northwest and Yorkshire. Two thirds of everybody going into hospital in the country in those places. This is serious. It is getting out of control and we have to do something to bring it back under control. Now, of course, there's been some local lockdown restrictions um, moving to single household. Obviously, the curfew for 10 p.m. has been uh, there for everybody. Um, the rule of six across the country, but the cases are still rising. So we do need to I mean, we definitely need to work locally and we definitely need to make sure that the communications are much clearer. And I do agree with you, Andy, and you know, I think it's probably very frustrating for everybody if leaks are made or the speculation in the press. And I don't know which of those it is, but Clearly, we have to do something if we're going to bring those cases back under control. We have one thing that we need to do, which is to try and get that R rate back to below one. That's what, the only what about support for businesses, for example? Well, of course, we've done unprecedented support for businesses. You know, the furlough scheme. No, but from here on in. Well, we have the furlough scheme is still existing. It's still in place until the end of this month. Then we have the winter economic package, which is introduced from the 1st of November, uh, with, which is for restrictions and, and restricted times. The Chancellor has looked at uh, some specific industries as well. There's been specific sector deals, specific sector support. We have said that we will support businesses. We have support businesses. There's been grants, there's been VAT Julian, cuts, there's been business you, rate cuts, you, there's been VAT closed deferrals. pubs and restaurants in Bolton overnight just a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. but the people who work behind the bar in those places or in the kitchen got no support at all. Do you think that is right? Well, the people would be entitled to furlough. No, they weren't. Why no, were they not? Because it was closed fellow. overnight. It was th their jobs were just taken away from them uh, overnight. Well, their employers could have put them into furlough. That's exactly what that scheme is there for. It is there for, you know, everything was closed overnight. On the 23rd of March, everything was closed overnight. You know, look at the skies. You won't see hardly any planes flying. You go on a train, there'll be hardly any, well, Michael can tell us, but there'll be hardly anybody Honestly, on the Jillian, train. People who are working behind bars can't be put easily into a furlough scheme. But well, the they point, were put the into point, furlough schemes. The point that you're missing is... All we, across the country. We've been under restrictions, months, they were. local restrictions, without support. And that's happened all summer. <clears throat> if you're going to introduce a traffic light scheme that will trap large parts of the north of England under severe restrictions this, this winter, can I ask you, do you think we need a proper support scheme so that we don't see major loss of jobs major business failure would would you commit to that tonight because if you will i will work with your government to then put that in place what we were presented with is restrictions without support and that is not acceptable to us for some reason andy you seem to not have realized that the furlough scheme that we put in place in march which is still in place today which we spent 40 billion pounds on has but also it's closed it's, Julia, as i'm sure you know in it, your it job it's closed to new entrants it, yes, but it closed. It, it's at the end of this month, but it's been there for well, all the time. It closed the new entrance. The Bolton staff could not access that that scheme. It closed that, on the thirtieth of June. And the point is, is furlough ends on the end of this yes, month. Yes, and we have and industries like aviation, for instance, can't come back. So the damage you're going to do to those people who work in regional airports, as, as combined with the with the local restrictions, mm. means that. Fragile economies in the north are going to be. Can I just correct down. you? It's the damage that the coronavirus, the global pandemic, is doing. The government has been there to help as many as many people as we can every step of the way. Okay. It is not the government that are doing this. It is the coronavirus. It's the public health okay. epidemic that we the are dealing with. The government are Andy. choosing to close bars and restaurants. Andy, I want to hear from the audience. That's your as well. choice, Jack. You well, asked the question. You had your hand up again. Public health is an issue, Jack. Yeah, I mean, like, in terms of a national lockdown, if it is necessary, then, you know, it's necessary. But I think that the thing I fear about, I, I work in the hospitality industry, is 
with the furlough, that does come to, the, come to an end at the end of the month. And come the 1st of November, the, the scheme that's in place it isn't going to be able to pay my bills and for me to be able to live coming into winter where it's colder, you need to use heating more. Um, and, and, you know, nobody blames the government for coronavirus, obviously. It's completely out of your hands. But when it comes to people living, like, I fear that we are going to lose a lot of team, like, in, from my, uh, where I work anyway. Um, we're not going to be able to like, afford to live. Um, and it's such last minute, like, as he said, with the, with the North, it was overnight. Being able to close a business and tell your team they cannot work and you don't know what's going to happen with their pay overnight, just, it, it's worrying. It's really worrying. Mm. Uh, Jasper? Yeah, I'd just like to say that we've got to remember behind all the big numbers of people, you know, they, they're losing jobs, uh, they'll suffer from mental health, financial burdens, <laughs> pressures on family, huge. And it's because it's unprecedented. Why can't we take unprecedented actions? Why can't we just say, take all the politics out of this? Because it always feels like a bit of a slanging match. Why can't you just sort of like say, you know what, have a uniform government and take massive big actions because it really needs to be, have a more of a humanitarian approach to this rather than a political approach. Take the politics out, put the people forward first. Because, you know, if someone said to me, your job's gone the next day, I wouldn't know what to do. And but Paul, Paul, I'm going to use your surname because we've got three Pauls in our, in our little virtual audience. So, so Paul Summerfield. Yeah, good evening. There's no doubt about it. Andy, I certainly appreciate and understand where you're coming from, but I certainly agree with what Jasper has just said in as much as we really must unite. We must stop Boris, bash Boris bashing. There's been no other prime minister who's, who's governed during such horrendous times in our peacetime. Now's the time for the United Kingdom to all unite, get back, get behind him <laughs> and stick to the rules and the regulations because there is no quick fix. It's not going to be easy. There are going to be hardships. I stress we must all unite. Can I just and reassure you both, though, that I said Andy. to the government this week, let's reset things, bring national and local government back together. Let's agree these traffic lights, but get the support right as well. And then just two days later, a front page of The Times says bars to shut across northern England. I, that's just okay. that explains my mood this no, evening. Nobody's okay. taken any decision lightly, Andy. Nobody. And obviously the scientific advisors are there, they're with data every day. This is a serious situation. It is uh, it is very serious okay. and it's having an impact on people's health and is actually very I worrying. I must come to the rest of the panel as well. Uh, Yanis, you're talking just from Athens tonight. I mean Jack's question is is a second national lockdown not a case of if any more, but when? And then what about businesses that are struggling to survive? I mean Greece has had a, a a pretty good uh, coronavirus experience, relatively. Yes, uh, in a sense, we've been watching uh, with a look of glee in our collective face uh, as a result of the fact that for the first time in many years, we are not the butt of the European joke. You know, there's the United Kingdom doing worse than us. Uh, but besides joking, uh, Greece uh, has done much better than the United Kingdom for two reasons. First, because the Balkan Peninsula has, uh, happily for us, been outside the thoroughfare of the trajectory of COVID-19. Uh, we are not as uh, promiscuous uh, in terms of uh, being a hub of finance, of tourism, like Britain is. <clears throat> so that has sheltered us. And also the government, and remember I'm saying this as a, a leader of an opposition party, the government, nevertheless, was quick to respond, unlike Boris Johnson. They went into lockdown quickly. They wasted a fantastic opportunity, however, to plan for phase two. So now I think they've lost uh, control of phase two. Um, it, it, what's striking about this conversation is that it's very similar to the ones we're having in this neck of the woods. Michael Putino. Um, <clears throat> Jack's first question was, um, is there going to be a second lockdown? I think the answer to that is no. It's not going to be the same as before. For example, I think the government is absolutely determined not to close schools, and I think it will want to keep a lot of businesses open. Mm -hmm. I think this time it will look much more carefully at what is the relationship between new cases and hospitaliz hospitalizations, people on ventilators, the number of deaths, and I think there will be a different uh, approach to risk. The other thing, though, that I think has to change, and I very much sympathise with Andy on this, is that the government has to take more voices into consideration before it makes decisions. 
And on the one hand, that means Parliament. So it isn't good enough to make decisions and then retrospectively to ask Parliament's opinion. And I think the government would be very well advised to consult more with local authorities. Indeed, I would go much further. I think the government should give many of the responsibilities for, to the local authorities and for local authorities to take the actions which they deem to be appropriate. And what difference do you think that would make? Well, uh, uh, we, I think it would make a difference certainly to the political conversation. I mean, people like Andy would be singing a different tune if that were the case. I personally think it's more likely that public health officials at the regional, city and local level understand the situation better than officials who are central. But there's also a political point, which is that the questions about this disease are very difficult to answer. You know, what is the objective now? Is the objective to reduce the number of deaths, mm -hmm. to reduce the number of deaths to zero? Is it to stop the NHS being overwhelmed? Is it to strike a balance? Are we now interested in group immunity? I mean, these questions are terribly difficult to answer. And I think instead of the government having to answer all these questions, mayors should have to answer these questions right. as well. So, you know, by all means, let Andy do something different in Manchester from what his equivalent is doing in Liverpool and somebody else is doing uh, in, in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. So let us have regional diversity. There's also, by the way, another reason why I think this might be a benefit to the uh, government, which is it, re it would reduce its Scottish political problem. Because at the moment, you have Boris Johnson on the one hand, you have Nicola Sturgeon, who's perceived as doing very much better. If you had a variety of regional voices, so Andy doing his policies, the mayor of Liverpool doing his policies, you, you would reduce... Uh, so it's, it's spreading the blame, that's what you're talking about. I, uh, well, I'm spreading the blame, spreading the responsibility. Mm. Uh, but also, I mean, let me go back to my previous point. If you have a debate in Parliament, the funny thing that happens is that people pop up with all sorts of common sense questions. You know, how does this work? Will it apply to this person? Will it apply to that person? And funnily enough, through parliamentary debate, because members of parliament talk to their constituents who are members of the public, you get common sense points of view which are brought forward before legislation is drafted rather than afterwards. And if they come up afterwards, then the government has to explain them away rather than improving the legislation. So Donna, Jack's question is, is a second national lockdown not a case of if anymore, but when? I mean, you're at the front line of all this. What's your view and is that something that you would, you would welcome? So it's a worry because we are seeing cases rise. But actually, the, the answer to that, Jack, depends on how we behave. We've already been through coronavirus. We've been to the height of the pandemic. We know what to do if we want to suppress this virus. We know what actions we need to take. And yes, of course, we're talking about two different things. They're irreconcilable. You know, one is how are we going to maintain the economy, keep our jobs? The other one is about how are we going to keep ourselves well, healthy and save lives? And we have to remember that this virus causes untold problems for some of our populations. It's not all of our populations, but for some of our populations. And, you know, I take the panel back to, actually, unless you've got health, you've got no economy, the dead don't pay taxes. So, actually, there is something that is a first order and something that may just be second order. So, I'd, I'd just like, you know, having been a nurse that's fought through this, I think it's important to recognise that, yes, there are other things like the economy, keeping the jobs going, but dead people can't work. So for me, it's hugely important that we actually protect the populations that are vulnerable. And the other thing and is... Does that mean you want tighter restrictions then, Donna? Um, I want people to practise the restrictions mm. that, that are out there. So you think people, people aren't obeying them at the moment? I think, in I, think I spoke to about 100 nurses today and I spoke to others in um, West Yorkshire. And, you know, example after example of, of people that, that weren't following the restrictions, actually. And for those nurses, it was quite heartfelt because actually they'd been on the front line. They'd done their bit, they'd stepped up, they'd worked more hours, they'd left their children and moved out of their homes. Mm. Um, and so it's quite important, actually, that when we, we don't lose sight of the fact that <coughs> the behaviours that we adopt can help save lives. And maybe if it's not my life or somebody else's life, um, it, it could be their own life. So I think it, let's not lose sight of the fact that we are in a pandemic and we do have to 
protect lives. And, and yes, of course, we do need to protect the economy. But actually, if you haven't got life, you can't protect the economy. I'm going to take another question, but before I do, I just wanted to mention where we're going to be in the coming weeks. We are looking for people to join our virtual audience, as of course we have here tonight. Uh, next week we are in Edinburgh, and the week after that we're in Sedgefield, of course Tony Blair's old constituency, uh, one of the red wall seats that turned blue at, at the last election. So if you live in either of those two areas, or, or thereabouts, around there, do get in touch by going to the Question Time website. You can follow the instructions there and come and be part of our virtual audience. We'd love to hear from you. And let's hear from one of our virtual audience now, who is here with us, Carl Timpson. Hi, Fiona. Um, I'd like to say, um, given the disruption COVID's had on the public so far, and the mis mixed messages and confusion between parties, what measures are the government um, taking to um, pl in planning ahead for the future? And are you, are you thinking if, if we have a vaccine or if we don't have a vaccine, Carl? Yeah, yeah. Planning ahead if we do have, a, well, if we don't have a vaccine, what if we don't find the vaccine in time before the end of the year? What is the government's plan? <clears throat> so what's the strategy, Gillian? We all know a lot of work's been being done on the vaccine, the government support it. You don't need to tell us that. What, what, what is the strategy? Um, well, we, we have the, the overall strategy, and Michael mentioned this, is to try and get the R rate back below one. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do in suppressing the cases. So uh, uh, Donna's point is, is absolutely um, very warmly welcomed, and actually from the front line, from the nurses, saying, please, please, please follow the rules, because actually... The best things we can do, we know a bit more about this disease now, but transmission, it is very easily transmitted, but we can do an awful lot to stop that. Really, this hands-face space, it isn't a rhyme, it's really serious. In terms of what we're doing to prepare, to, to better prepare, the, the thing that we're trying to work on is, is obviously the vaccine, and we have uh, the two camps, uh, two groups here uh, that seem to be leading the way, but as you say, that will be binary, it will work or, or it won't at some point. In terms of testing, we've got another two streams. So the first is to have um, a lot more testing, so 500,000 uh, tests per day uh, by the end of this month, and the moonshot, which is uh, millions um, a day in, in the early next year. And that really relies on the pilots that we're doing now with the rapid testing, the saliva testing. There's a number of different pilots going on. That, if you can get to those kinds of tests, it does give you some options. So, to... so the strategy then is either for a vaccine to kind of come to the rescue or to, to, to have so many, so much testing, in fact, that we don't have to go into serious restrictions one after the other. To live with it in a way that you can use testing effectively. So, for example, for venues, you could use a test, you could have a rapid turnaround, you could tell if somebody was negative, they could go into the venue. And can I just that ask you about the, the sort the, of... Um, that, that we're working on those in parallel. And let me just well. ask you about the vaccine, because there are reports this week that when a vaccine does come along, uh, if, if and when it comes along, it, it will only be offered to 50% of the population. Is that right? I don't know where those reports came from. We, obviously, we will get as much of the vaccine as we can, and we've so, secured already. So is know. that right or not right? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's right, but we will go until we get all of, you know, the whole population. That this was the head of the vaccine, vaccine. programme that was saying that, which is why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, you know... I guess they would know. I suppose they would know. I suppose that's where they're going to start. If you start with a vaccine, I would imagine you will go to as many people who want the vaccine. It's not like the vaccine is going to be sort of depleted and, you know, and, and then it, there's no longer any vaccine. It can be made again. So, you know, it, I think the question actually is not about the percentage. It's about how long it takes to get enough of the population uh, vaccinated and also the prioritisation of the vaccination, which I'm sure will include some of the more vulnerable groups that Donna referred to would be top of the list. But Donna, where do you think the government should be going? I mean, Boris Johnson has talked about, you know, we're going to have a bumpy six months ahead. We, none of us really know what's going to be happening around Christmas <coughs> and beyond. I think um, if a vaccine comes along, all well and good. But actually, there's something about us living with a, a new normal. Um, because actually, whatever happens now, we can see that we will suppress and then we'll spike. So that's, that's if you look at the, how, the, how the, vac the trajectory to date, we've seen that we all took really restrictive action. And the minute we started loosening, we started to get some spikes. So I think we are going to have to get used to a new norm. We are going to have to do the things that we're doing, like the face, the, the masks, the hand washing, the social distancing. 
I think it, for us as a, a as a people, it's a new thing that we have to get used to. <coughs> Clearly, at some point, we are going to have to go back to work and and earn and work, have pubs and. But actually, as we learn more and more about the virus, I mean, it's been around for now. It's relatively young, really. Um, so as it as I think time will teach us a bit more. And Michael, I mean, as Donna says, you know, people are going to have to go back to work. Lots of people are not able to go back to work at the moment. I mean, part of the government strategy mm. is, is, is clearly the economy mm. and quite, you know, and, and government debt has passed two trillion pounds for the first time in history. I mean, that's going to surely got to be a large part of the strategy going forward. Well, as, as I said, I, I feel sure we're not going back to total lockdown. What was quite effective in controlling the virus was total lockdown. But if I'm right that we're not going back to that and partial lockdown seems to be relatively ineffective, then what that implies is that we're going to live with levels of the virus. Now, what we know is that the virus is much more lethal for certain age groups and certain sorts of people and much less lethal for others. So I think there will eventually emerge a difference of policy towards people of different age groups and different vulnerabilities, which will mean that younger people will be encouraged to go back to work and older people will be protected. And the protection of the older people will be partly, I think, in the hands of individuals. So if you're going to visit your elderly parents, you'll want to make sure maybe that you've been tested, maybe that you've been quarantined for some days before you go to see your parents. And at some levels, it will be institutional. So where, for example, young and old meat is in care homes, well, young people who go into work in care homes who have a social life outside, they're going to have to be tested, I would say, on a daily basis. We've absolutely got to make sure that we maintain that frontier. So I think, although I don't believe this has been talked about very much, we are going to see the emergence of a strategy which looks very different from the strategy that we've come from. And on your point about the um, two trillion, at no point has the government, or I dare say any government anywhere in the world, tried to calculate what it's worth spending. We have shied away from the question of what human life is worth. It's too dangerous a subject. Of course, we do do this in lots of other contexts. You know, if we're going to build a bypass, we say, how many lives is it going to save and is it worth doing? But in this context, we haven't. I'm pretty sure that the money we've spent, the ruin that's been brought, the mental health issues that have arisen, the cancellation of the cancer operations, uh, the number of people who have developed other diseases, the mortality of those people who have not been treated, I'm pretty sure that all of that is not worth the lives that we may have saved. But no one's willing to calculate that. But I think at some point, unless the uh, vaccine comes along, we're going to have to have a different approach in which we say this thing is going to be around and we will therefore have to think about who is able to live with it and who must be excluded from it and how do we protect the barriers between these two, pop these two populations. And, and Yanis, sitting where you are in Athens, what's your take? Well, let me first answer Carl's question about what governments can actually do the main uh, task is a proper test and trace, trace regime system. Unfortunately, Boris Johnson and our prime minister here during the, the lockdown made the far-fetched promises about, you know, world-beating, superlative um, test, testing and tracing systems, and they did not deliver. And that eroded trust in our governments at a time when lives depend on the maintenance of that trust. Uh, it's not just a question of money. Greece is broke. Uh, our governments, uh, as you know, are hugely indebted and they could not put the amount of money into the testing regime that the United Kingdom government did. But the shambles in the United Kingdom with the testing regime proves that uh, it, it's not just a question of penny pension, it's a question of where you spend the money. And this uh, obsession with um, uh, subcontracting to you know, private medical mega firms uh, the, the the testing system, which has the you know it's, it's called an NHS testing and tracing system, but it's not it does not involve the NHS. All the expertise of the NHS is not part and parcel of this system, and therefore you have complete failure as one company subcontracts to another. That's uh, the answer to Carl on the question of the economy. Allow me to say that you know I've been, I was watching your chancellor over the the last months, and I thought he had a pretty good pandemic until recently. Um, and then he made this derisory speech in which to please a crowd of Tories. 
He talked about his sacred duty to balance the books and to end furlough at the end of October, as you, know, you all know better than me, and to replace it with a feeble job, job support scheme. Now, this is not simply going to create huge uncertainty in the mind of the most precarious, the young, the indebted, those people who are using credit cards to put food on the table before the pandemic. But it is also an act of vandalism on the United Kingdom's public, fin public finances. Because, Fiona, uh, and this is how I end, however hard he shrinks public expenditure during a period of a serious depression, uh, the tax take of the government is going to be collapsing faster and he will not be able to increase, to increase, to decrease his spending at a rate that will catch up with a decrease in his revenues without destroying the Boris Johnson government. David, you've got your hand up. I think the uh, future strategy for the government should not look at the symptoms, which is what they're looking at at the moment, but the actual diagnosis of the problem. And I was pleased to see today that there was an announcement, I think, by the government that they're going to spend several thousand pounds, which the local councils are going to have, to employ marshals and the police to really focus on the true diagnosis, which is what, where is the cause of this problem? And the cause of this problem is that people are just not, some people are just not adhering to the government guidelines. The only way this virus moves from one person to another is by somebody being within two metres of each other. And I think that's, that's where the, the government should f focus its efforts, quite frankly. On making people obey the restrictions, is what you're saying? Yes, because, the, I mean, you see these people gallivanting around. They might be in a minority, but the only way the numbers are increasing is because they're just not following what the government is dictating. And that is, use the mask, keep t t two metres apart from each other, and uh, wash your hands regularly. And if people did that, this virus just would not grow and we'd be out of the problem. And if, if it continues to grow like this, then the government's got to spend money as a future strategy to employ these people, marshals or whatever they are, to really focus on the areas where these people are breaking the law. Well, as you're talking, David, lots of hands going up. Ben. I think it's easy to talk about what the government's future strategy is going to be, but have they lost the trust of the public too much and the, I suppose that's just not the Conservatives as well look at cross parties over the last 10 days Jeremy Corbyn's hosted a party at his house for 10 people uh, the SNP MP who got the train infected all the way back to Scotland the SNP MP you're talking about Margaret Ferry SNP MP, yes. um, yeah I, I just think that regardless of what the future strategy is has the trust gone of course, I say SNP MP, of course, she's lost the whip, so she's not an SNP MP anymore, uh, technically speaking. Uh, Laura. Hi. Um, yeah, just on that, that point before, I think it's very difficult, obviously, for us to predict what's going to happen, but to, sit, to blame the people when the government strategy was obviously to open bars and restaurants and then to automatically shut them down so quickly. And we know that, um, as Donna mentioned, it's going to spike and then it's going to reduce again. I think it's more about has the government learned from this latest um, wave or beginning of this wave of where we are um, and what do the panel think I guess about how that has immediately been handled as seeing that we're seeing a rise and a, and a spike in cases I suppose. Farai. Yeah just listening into what everybody's been saying I think one of the reoccurring themes for me is around the communication of whatever anybody's going to do the issue remains how the information is communicated to the public and how people react. And that's where we're seeing the problem because information is being trickled down to, to local authorities um, and to newspapers and people aren't able to react effectively. And that's when we're getting the mixed, mixed messages and people behaving differently because people are hearing and absorbing the information for what it means to them. And I just think that's something that we all need to acknowledge and work together in essence. I should just clarify that Jeremy Corbyn was attending a wake, incidentally, not, not hosting a party. There were two, more than six people there, but it wasn't actually a party at his home. Andy, you were health secretary once. Um, Carl's question is about what measures can the public expect the government to take, in particular if a vaccine is not ready. What would you do? So, as Gillian said at the start, it is a serious situation. It is hard. I was health secretary when we had swine flu. I didn't get everything right. So you know, I would acknowledge all of those things. Farai just made a really good point, mm -hmm. though, that there are too many mixed messages. 
we're under local restrictions in the northwest to stop gatherings in the home. I would say this 10 p.m. curfew creates gatherings in the home because it puts everyone out of the pub at the same time into the supermarket and then on to, to a gathering. So they've got to decide what are they trying to do, get the evidence behind it, I think as Fry is saying, and then there may be more buy-in to what they're doing. But to answer the question, what would I do? I think Michael and Yanis have got this right. The government strategy, I'm afraid, has been to centralise and to privatise when it should have been to localise. And if they'd done that at the start, I think they would have been able to have a much better sharing of responsibility. There are public health teams in local authorities who have been bypassed when it comes to testing and contact tracing. And just to, to say it's not too late, you know, we could still change things. The national test and trace system, the NHS test and trace system, which Yanis rightly said isn't much of an NHS system. Currently, it reaches three quarters of people who test positive in Greater Manchester. It doesn't reach a quarter. And it reaches half of their family and friends, half of their contacts. Now, that is not good enough going into winter for us. And why is it not performing better? It's the difference between a call centre, disconnected from communities, or people on the ground going doorstep to doorstep. When local teams do it in Greater Manchester, there is a much, much higher success rate. And that is what I would do to answer the question. I would switch resources from these national contracts. I would put it, as Michael said, into local authorities. I've asked Greater Manchester Police and Greater Manchester Fire to help with contact tracing, to show that we are putting forward solutions. We're not just criticising. But that is what the government should do. And I am, I am happy to take responsibility and be held accountable for improving those, uh, those uh, contact rates than we've currently got. So we need to fix, test and trace before we go into the winter. But Yanis is right too. We need to extend furlough for those sectors that won't be able to come back anytime soon, like aviation like hospitality, like live events. That is what we should do, because then we would get more buy-in to the government strategy, people would feel supported, and we could get through a difficult winter. If they don't do those things, I think we're looking at a winter of deep discontent in the north of England. Let's hear from Paul O'Donnell. Yeah, yeah, just sort of going off that, uh, the, I think it sort of is about that two-way conversation, and the conversation... Um, is not just government outwards to those localised centres, but it's also to ensure that, that people like you, Andy, can have conversations back and can inform their decisions as they make those decisions. And you've got a specific question, Paul. Yes, I have. Um, a lot of musicians and artists took offence at Rishi Sunak's comments this week. As commentary prepares for being UK City of Culture in 2021, what are the government going to do to ensure that independent artists survive that long? So for those of you who are not aware uh, about the comments you're referring to, uh, Paul, uh, Rishi Sunak was on another channel. Uh, he was asked what the government will do for people in the arts specifically who can't work. And he, and, and he talked generally about new job schemes uh, and, and said they are a fresh and new opportunity for people. Today, uh, the Chancellor denied he meant that people in the arts should retrain. In fact, he said they don't need to retrain. I mean, Yanis, does it come back to providing well, greater furlough schemes, greater opportunities for people, and particularly in the arts, music, theatre sector? It's funny you should ask that, uh, because we had recently a debate in Parliament here in Greece uh, about precisely this, this issue. Uh, and uh, it was our party's position that we have to have a special furlough for people who are in the arts and who've been hit twice by the fact that theatres, pubs and music venues have closed down, while you know their second job or main job uh, in the service sector has already been hit. And um, I think Michael Portillo might appreciate that. In Parliament, I quoted, uh, uh, paraphrased slightly, Winston Churchill saying, um, ill fares the people who fail to salute the arts with their reverence and delight uh, which are their due. Um, allow me just to make a point regarding generally supporting those that deserve support at the moment. Um, you know, the Bank of England is printing mountain ranges of money, uh, which it hopes to lend to the 
City of London banks, hopefully so that they pass it on to business, hoping that the business will not buy back their own shares, but they will, you know, invest in good quality jobs. This chain is not working. Imagine if the Bank of England did that which, you know, the monetary authorities of Hong Kong did at the beginning of lockdown, or what Australia did in 2009. And this is something where I believe that, you know, uh, a lefty like myself and a Thatcherite can agree, because it's an original idea by Thomas Paine on the one hand and Milton Friedman on the other. Imagine if the Bank of England, instead of passing the money on to the, to the commercial banks, were to put it in the bank account of every citizen of the United Kingdom, a certain amount of money until, until all boats are lifted up, including the artists. And Michael Portillo, could you agree with that? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I this is saying you're, you're both in agreement tonight. No, no, I, I, I don't dismiss it out of hand. Uh, I mean, we're all talking about how we're going to support people. And we want to support people partly so that they can feed themselves, but partly so that they can spend money in the economy, which provides jobs for other people. So I don't dismiss it uh, I I entirely out of hand. I, I think the other approach I would have to the arts, the government very often asks the question, you know, what could we do? And the answer comes back, well, you've got to close the theatres. See, if I were a minister, I think I would say, no, I want to know how I would keep the theatres open. What would we have to do for the theatres to be open? But actually, having the theatres open, it seems to be an easier question, actually, than opening restaurants mm -hmm. in, in the sense that you can sit in a theatre uh, covered up. So whatever, whatever the appropriate covering is. You know, when you go into a restaurant, you have to take the covering off because you've got to eat. Um, when you go into a theatre, you don't have to. But so the thing is, it, but you, you, you have to, at the moment anyway, mm -hmm. you have to have fewer people in the theatre, which makes well, it a very expensive production relative to the money you get in from people buying tickets. Well, f f first of all, I don't know whether that's true. I don't know whether if people were appropriately clothed, um, whether they could go to the theatre and not maintain the same social distancing. But in any case, I would uh, want the theatres... I, I wouldn't say the theatres have to be closed. I would say the theatres should be open. The maximum number of people, and if it has to be relayed to another theatre where there's another group of people. In other words, what we need to do is find ways of making things happen, not just accept that everything has to be closed down. We had the same on transport. You know, we were told that only 10% of people could travel, or, uh, by comparison with earlier, on transport. That's not a good enough answer. The question is, how do you get 100% of people back on transport? What is it that we need to do scientifically in people's apparel or whatever to get back to where we were? Uh, Laura, you had your hand up. Hi, yeah, just just on this point as well. I happen to live in in actually in Stratford upon Avon, and obviously the news, the announcement of the RSC closing two of its theatres until twenty twenty two, that just has a massive knock on on the on the local economy as well. Um, so we need to find a way to support the arts in order um, for these businesses to continue to thrive. Um, so it was just really around that, just a comment about that, really. Amy. Hello. Um, a lot of people turned to the arts um, when lockdown happened, and I feel like they've kind of been forgot about. And you think they should get more support? Yeah, definitely. Steve? For, so further to Donna's comments about there being a new norm, then why don't we consider a new economic policy and a uh, universal income? Um, that would benefit all, not just those in the arts, but um, you know, raising everybody up. Uh, and, and perhaps kick-starting the economy that way. And Paul, you, Paul O'Donnell, you asked this question, Richard. Do you, forgive me, I should know this, but do you work in the arts? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a theatre maker. I tour up and down the country and internationally when I get a chance. Um, and so, and how has this all affected you? Have you had any work? Are, are you benefiting from any of the, the money that the government has, has had to offer? Um, I was lucky enough to get the self-employed income support, um, but I understand that the, the theatre industry, the, the sector, hasn't been so fortunate in that. 70% um, of the industry are, are freelancers, and I think only about 30% of them in theatre uh, were eligible for that support. So there's a lot of people in the industry who haven't had any income for seven months. Um, and now we've got to this point um, in the crossroads when, when the self-employed income support is ending, and it feels to the industry very much like government is sort of approaching it with the the deal with it approach um, and telling us that there's not going to be any further support for the industry um, and and importantly for the artists that are working with it and I mean artists as in designers, technicians, 
um, anybody that works around the theatre, they're all they've all been affected by this. So, Gillian, I mean, Rishi Sunak was very keen to make it clear today that he explicitly was not suggesting that, that people who work in, in the arts should retrain. But if they can't work, what are they supposed to do? So, just I think it's important to say what Rishi was saying because actually, we well, have I'm not... just quoting you what he said today. Was he said he specifically was very clear. This, these are his words. Yes. That, that, that he doesn't, he's not saying that these people should retrain. So given that, how do you expect them to, to, to get by? So we had Nicola Bernadetti yesterday. She had, I think it was yesterday the, the day before, she had violins, she had uh, people out uh, in Parliament. Of course, the arts are, are important. Everybody loves the arts. They're a massive uh, export, they're a massive differentiator for our country. Um, and they're hugely important. That's why there has been a package of £1.57 billion on top of the furlough self-employment schemes, etc. Now, nobody is saying um, at all, and you know, the Chancellor hasn't said, that, that you know, the, there's no support for anything forever. He's basically said he keeps everything under review. We know that. But I, I want to say something that I think that we've lost the focus on. This has not been an even economic disruption with coronavirus. About more than half of our economy is actually growing massively so if you're in health if you're in food if you're in it yeah, but hang if you're on, in digital, we're way off the question hang on no, a minute but Paul's this question is, is what the, are the government or is, it was important to answer the question as well what are the government going to do to ensure that independent artists survive that long as Con coventry because we've got our audience from coventry prepare for uk city of culture in 2021 so what is the government going to do to ensure that people like paul uh, and uh, and others do survive that long the if they're not if they're not the, the government has the given £1.57 billion pounds has gone into rescuing the arts sector. That's to organisations, not That's, to individual They artists. haven't worked out yet how it's all going through. So it's going through a number of different routes. It, I don't know, they're organising themselves how that happens. I don't know any more detail on that. But that, there's, there's many sectors who haven't had that support. The arts has had that support, plus the other schemes are there. And, you know, of course, we're not going to sit here and, and let, you know, all, all of our uh, uh, arts or all of our culture, everything disappear so we've got nothing left. We are there to support, which is why that's, just, that's been put in place. And I know that the culture secretary is talking, I mean, talking about sports. There's, every, there's many, many sectors. You could apply this question to many sectors. What I was wanting to say, and I think is important, is that the first six weeks as an apprenticeships and skills minister, every meeting I had was about massive skill shortages in this economy. Hundreds of thousands of skill shortages in nursing, in mental health, social care, engineering. So do you think they everything. should retrain then? There was many opportunities for people to retrain. I'm not saying, because this is where, where people say, well, you know, I don't want to retrain. It's not forcing people to retrain. It's just saying if you're a young person or if you're looking for your second career, this is my second career. I've been in business for 30 years. If you're looking for something different to do, there are many opportunities. We've got many skills shortages. And that's why we, we put a big announcement together for adult skills, f to, to help people to retrain, to make it much more easily. Some people want a second career. We're working for a long time now. It can be right. And I've met many people okay. who've been made redundant in the past who've used this to retrain and to go into nursing, for example, that they'd wanted to do from school, but never got the opportunity. So Donnie, it is an important too, message. Donnie, you're not looking too chuffed with what you're hearing. I mean, you know, the government's saying it's going to get 50,000 more nurses. Maybe this is how. Um, it, I'd be delighted. I'm not, I'm not looking um, unhappy. I'd be delighted. But as I said, first of all, nursing, you have to want to be a nurse. Mm. And um, it's a lot of hard work to be a nurse. Um, we are 50, uh, you know, we started this pandemic 50,000 nurses short. And we're 50,000 nurses short because nurses, as uh, is been treated as a vocation, it's not been paid properly. Uh, we've stepped up, we've served. So there's going to have to be much more than just saying retrain because actually people want a good quality of life and that includes paying people properly and, and what recognising their skills and their values. What do you think of government suggestions that we've heard about people who work in cinemas, for example, or cabin crew who could retain and work in the, retrain and work in the care sector? Is that a goer? It might be if they've got, you know, if you could acquire the skills and the education and you've got the um, ability to be a nurse or a carer, I think it, it I'm not going to say it's not a goer because there is a, a shortage of nurses. We know that. Um, however, it's still a complex skill. 
It requires, you've seen how we've battled on the front line and we're about, you know, we did a survey recently, 37% said they wanted to leave the profession. So actually, it's not as easy as, um, yeah, just retrain to be a nurse. It is actually quite a hardcore career, but 37% said we've been through the pandemic, um, we've seen enough death, thanks, we're up, we want to be off. Andy. I mean, Gillian's right. The government have put a lot of support in in different ways. Of, of course they have. But to answer Paul's question, you know, why are people in the arts still kind of speaking out? Well, I think there's two reasons why. The first is many people who work in the arts are self-employed or freelancers. And the truth is the Chancellor never gave those people enough support. They were missed out uh, back in April. Well, there was a support As scheme for the self-employed. It's, it's coming to an end now. But... Everybody, you know, people who were newly self-employed didn't get support. They missed out low-paid company directors was another group. So it never was the case that everybody got support. Some people were missed and many of them work uh, in the arts. But the second reason I think people like Paul are, are you know, kind of feeling frustrated this week is it's as if the government are making a judgment about some jobs are viable and some jobs are not viable. And they're almost putting the arts into the not viable no, category not. And, and encouraging people <clears throat> to retrain. There is no doubt at all in my mind that if the support is put in now to keep people going, the arts will come roaring back mm -hmm. uh, at the end of this, as will other sectors as well, who just simply can't function properly at this moment in time. And I think that's what people are getting frustrated about, as though the arts can just be sort of left to go. Because for us... The arts are the, the lifeblood of, of Manchester. You know, the, the city thrives on uh, the institutions that we've got. And I just, you know, put this to people. If we come through this, and we come through this crisis, and we look up, and the theatres have closed, and our music venues have closed, and everything else we love has gone, then COVID will have won, basically. Let me take a very quick question the time we have left from Jenny. Hi, um, my question is, will Donald Trump get the sympathy vote? After, of course, he's contracted coronavirus, is what you're referring to, to yeah. Jenny. It's yeah. only been interesting to, to watch from over here, from over this side of the Atlantic. Uh, Michael? The immediate reaction in the polls seems to have been adverse for Donald Trump, which I must say has slightly surprised me. I, I have a feeling, reading the American public as best I can, that there will be a bit of a resurgence in Trump's support and that there will be a little bit of a closing of the gap uh, with, uh, with Biden. Um, I, I, I think a big mistake has been made today, allowing Trump effectively to pull out of the next debate because they changed the rules. They were going to make it virtual. However, at this stage, it looks as though the gap between Trump and Biden is uh, too, uh, too, too, too great to cover in the remaining days before the election. So I would expect a closer result than the polls are suggesting at the moment, but probably nonetheless a Biden victory. And Gillian... Donald Trump described his, his, his contracting coronavirus as, as a blessing, as a gift from God. Was it a gift from God for Boris Johnson? Uh, I certainly don't think he'd describe it like that. In fact, I don't think he has described it like that. Um, and, you know, and there's a serious point, actually, that there's a lot of people living with long COVID, which can affect anyone at any age. And we don't talk about that nearly enough. So anybody who thinks that, you know, sort of letting the cases rip and, you know, carrying on is a good idea. Uh, so do you think Donald Trump was wrong to say that then? Do you think he's behaved irresponsibly? Oh, I, think, I mean, I come think, on, I, Gillian. I, <laughs> say what I mean, you think. Don, Donald Trump, I mean, I think in the US, in terms of the question in the election, I think most people have decided it's so polarised. It's an unbelievably polarised uh, society. And I think, you know, will he get the sympathy vote i very much doubt it um but no i do i think he's been blessed and 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 god has has given him the answer not not necessarily no he's lucky to have survived it without any or it seems to be very low symptoms so you know for that uh, you know he will be thankful but that doesn't mean that his case is going to be the same for everybody else's case which is kind of you know what he might be saying if you you know take this drug look everybody it's this is nothing to worry about that is completely wrong you think he's wrong to say that i think it is wrong because well donna will tell you she knows much more than i do but you know long covid does exist it affects people in different ways different age groups as well and it, it's very debilitating how do you think he's handled it my advice to Donald Trump would be to isolate and follow the rules. Um, <laughs> the rest of it. For a long time. <laughs> you know what I mean, isolate, follow the rules. Um, I'm not sure that Donald Trump would be anybody that I'd be listening to pronouncing on COVID. 
Right, well, you heard it here. Um, Andy? I think that's brilliant advice. <laughs> if you could isolate beyond November, whatever the election <laughs> day is, that'd be even better. But to answer uh, Jenny's question, how can you have sympathy for somebody who is still infectious but drags security staff on a uh, you know, drive around for his own purposes? I mean, how could you have sympathy for somebody who does that? How could you have sympathy for someone who's made a virtue of not wearing a mask all year, holding rallies without social distancing? You know, somebody said rightly before that politicians need to lead by example through this and, and through their actions do the right thing. That, that's what the job brings with it. That's what you should do. And he's done the complete opposite and he put his own health at risk, but he actually has put the health of millions of Americans at risk. Uh, through this. So I, I just, I'll make it plain, I have no sympathy for him whatsoever. I just hope, I think the world will be better, a better place if he's removed with a landslide uh, next month. I think we'll begin to get better politics around the world. You know, we've had two pandemics, haven't we? This year, COVID we've talked about, but we've had a pandemic growing over the last decade of xenophobia, nationalism, discrimination, hate, and we've seen that come to a head uh, this year on the streets of Minneapolis. You know, the wor this world, in my view, has kind of, you know, it needs a big correction here. We need to come out of this with a very different uh, mindset. And I just think, you know, it starts, I hope, with the removal of Donald Trump next month. Yanis, do you think you'll get the sympathy vote? Look, I agree with Andy that it is impossible to sympathize with somebody like Donald Trump. But where I disagree is with the premise of the question, if I may. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't do sympathy, does not follow the politics of sympathy, he does not trade on sympathy. He doesn't want sympathy. He trades on envy, on discontent, on anger, which he manipulates magnificently, as we have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw what he's not, he's not asked for the people, he support their sympathy. He asked for their envy. Look at how great I am. You know, I even managed to defeat COVID with the help of medicine. And I will give you the, 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 the stuff for free. Uh, th this is where we are, where we've been since 2016, perhaps a bit earlier than that. We've, um, you know, we, we've created circumstances of austerity for the many and, and socialism for the financiers um, that created discontent at an industrial scale. And people like Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, Le Pen, Salvini, Orban, and so on, trade on this. They do not want our sympathy. What we need to do, we must change the circumstances that beget the uh, energy that feeds them. OK, we are, I'm afraid, out of time. I can see a few of you have got your hands up. A few of you are applauding as well. So if you were actually here, we'd be able to hear you. But thank you very much for that. Um, Tonight, our questioners came from Coventry, as we saw. Next week, as I said earlier, we're going to be in Edinburgh with the Scottish Government Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, and the new leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Ross. The following week, we're in Sedgefield, where Nobel Prize-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz will be giving us his take on what's going on. And you can apply to be in our virtual audience. Go to the Question Time website, and you can follow the instructions there. Adrian Charles, as always, is coming up on Five Live with his guests on Question Time Extra Time. And you can see on the screen how to get in touch with that. But for now, I just want to say thank you very much to the panel for coming here tonight. Yanis, thank you very much for joining us from Athens. And of course, all our audience in Coventry, thank you for being part of this programme. Really appreciate you giving up your evening to do that. And of course, at you at home for watching. Thank you very much from Question Time. Bye-bye.